If you met God for a few minutes, what would you say to him? That was a question that was put to people online and there was no shortage of responses. So here from San Francisco would respond, hey, your code is so complicated and full of bugs and logical errors. Janu would say, thank you, dear Krishna. Tom Grennan, wow, God, I'm like your biggest fan. Mahek from Mumbai would ask, why have you created mosquitoes? Carlo Mazzini would say, hello, and then ask, how are you doing today? Jim Noblet thinks that he'd let God do the talking, but might try and steer the conversation towards whether New Orleans might possibly win the Super Bowl this year. But he wouldn't press the issue too much. What would you say, what would you do if you met God? Your answer probably reveals quite a bit about your view of God. I think previous generations might have emphasised the distance between us and God. They might have majored on the fact that God is unapproachable. Whereas perhaps today we're more likely to domesticate God, to bring him down to our level. Maybe we picture him a little bit like a a doting grandfather with whom you can pull the wool over his eyes is to get away with something and and who, if he caught you doing something wrong, might respond with a bit of a chuckle and uh, kids these days. You might see this view reflected in an area like prayer, for example, where we gradually slip into a casual approach, much like we would talk to a friend or a mate, even a flippant way of talking to God. We might also observe it in terms of our view on particular issues where we know God thinks a particular way that he's taken a particular stance on a topic but we think we know better and that our opinion ought to hold as much weight as his if not even more. This view, this picture of God, it also affects our obedience, our holiness as well, doesn't it? Because if God's like this doting grandfather figure, it's not going to matter if I dabble in this, if I let myself go in that area, because after all, he'll just have a bit of a chuckle and say, kids these days, and let us go on our way. As we come to our passage for today, the last in our series in Exodus for this term, Israel is brought to the mountain, to Mount Sinai, and they encounter God. They meet God. It's a moment that we've been waiting for ever since chapter 3, where God told Moses as he spoke to him out of the burning bush, right back towards the beginning in chapter 3, verse 12, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. You see, rescue wasn't the end point, as spectacular as that was. God had a plan and a purpose in rescuing his people out of Egypt. And that was that they would come to him, that they would be his people, that they would respond to him as they ought. It's a key moment, this, in the Old Testament, and it's also going to prove tremendously instructive for us as well. And what we'll do this morning is that we'll deal with just the first few verses in Exodus 19 in the first half of our time together, and then we'll cover the rest of chapter 19 and chapter 20 in the second half of our time. So don't get too concerned if you feel like we're taking a really long time on just a few verses. We'll speed up as we go along. But let's pray as we come to look at God's word together. Let's talk to him. Dear Lord, we want to think rightly of you. We want to respond to you in the way we ought. So please help us to have a clearer picture, a more accurate vision of you this morning. Correct any wrong thinking, any unhelpful ways of living that we might have slipped into. Help us to be humble and willing to change. Grow us 
in our knowledge and love of you, we pray. Amen. Well, what we see at the beginning of chapter 19 is that God is a rescuing God and that his people Israel are a rescued people. In verse 4, Moses is given this wonderful, this beautiful summary of the story so far. Chapter 19, verse 4, here's the Exodus account in a nutshell. We, we could have just looked at this all term, but God says to Moses, 19, 4, you've seen what I did to Egypt. Think of the plagues in chapters 7 to 12 and the judgment handed out at the Red Sea in chapters 13 to 15. You've seen what I did to Egypt. How I carried you on eagle's wings, God says. What, what a beautiful picture, isn't it? I'm reading The Hobbit again by a Tolkien and in The Hobbit there's this moment where Bilbo and the dwarves seem completely stuck What shall we do? What shall we do? Bilbo cries. Escaping goblins to be caught by wolves, he said. And it became a proverb, though we now say out of the frying pan into the fire in the same sort of uncomfortable situations. And so they climb up some nearby trees as quickly as they can, only that the wolves do come and surround them and the goblins come yelling and shouting at them and and they join with the wolves and the fire that Gandalf the wizard uh, uses to ward off the wolves ends up setting the trees alight and the goblins taunt them, fly away little birds, fly away if you can, come down little birds or you'll get roasted in your nests. Sing, sing, little birds, why don't you sing? The situation, it looks completely hopeless until the ancient race of eagles from the northern mountains, proud and strong and noble-hearted, led by the Lord of the eagles, swoop down just in the nick of time and carry the desperate band of travellers off to safety. That's how God pictures his rescue work here. He's been like an eagle swooping down to pluck his people out of danger and carry them off to safety, bringing them to himself, their place of safety and refuge. And now verse 5, if they obey him and keep his covenant, they will be his treasured possession. They will be, verse 6, a kingdom of priests, and a holy nation. We're going to look at those descriptions in a bit more detail in a moment, but I want us to make sure that we've noticed something that's very clear here, and that is the order of all of this. God saves. God rescues first. He brings his people to himself. God has acted to achieve this. The relationship is established. It's in place. They are his. And it's only then that he commands them to obey him, to live his way. So Israel are not told to live in a certain way in order to be saved. Israel are to live in a certain way because they've already been saved, because they're a rescued people, rescued by their rescuing God. It's really important that we see that and that we understand that because that's what we see right throughout the Bible. The same pattern, the same order is in place. We'll see it in the Ten Commandments. You see it right throughout the Old Testament and we see it in the New Testament as well. God acts first in his grace and in his mercy, to save a people to be his. And then he shows them and tells them and commands them to live in a way that reflects the fact that he has saved them. We don't obey in order to be saved. We obey because we've been saved. That's important to keep in mind, I think, as we talk with people who aren't Christians. See, if this is the order, the pattern that we see in the Bible, then we're not to communicate to others that they should live in a certain way in order to be right with God. They can only be right with God by his grace and his mercy displayed in Jesus. So we speak of his grace and mercy 
and we call on them to turn back to him, God accepts them as they are. And it's then that he starts getting to work in them, to change them. See, we've got to be careful that we communicate this clearly to others, this order, this pattern. But we also need to remember it for ourselves as Christians, don't we? As we go about living the Christian life, we're not earning God's favour by living the way that we do. We're not racking up merit points like being rewarded on some star chart for good behaviour. We don't receive God's love by doing what he says. We do what he says because we've received God's love. The relationship has already been established through Jesus' death and resurrection. We already belong to God through the blood of Jesus. We've already been rescued by our rescuing God. We are his. And we live in response to what he's done. In Exodus 19, verse 5, God says that if Israel live this way, live his way, if they obey him fully, they will be his treasured possession. God is a king who owns everything. The whole earth is his, but out of all the nations, Israel will be his treasured possession. The idea here is of something that is a personal treasure especially prized and distinctly his own in a unique way, even though he may possess a vast hoard, they are his treasured possession. They will also be, verse 6, a kingdom of priests. Israel will carry out a priestly function in the world. As priests, they will be the ones who have this special, unique access to God. And they will also have that particular ministry to those around them, representing God, acting on his behalf in the midst of the nations. And thirdly, they will be a holy nation. Though they are but one nation among among many, they will be set apart, they will be distinct, they will be different from the rest, sharing their God's holiness, as we'll see in chapter 20, and displaying that, putting that on show to all the peoples around them. As Moses brings these wonderful truths to the people, verse 8, they respond enthusiastically, don't they? Verse 8, the people all responded together, we will do everything the Lord has said. But given their track record so far in the book of Exodus, we'd be right to wonder whether they can put their money where their mouth is. And so it turns out. The story of the Old Testament is not one of wholehearted obedience. Even in the remainder of the book of Exodus, we see their failures displayed starkly. Think of the golden calf incident in chapter 32, if you've read that part of Exodus. You see, the ultimate fulfilment of these promises awaits the Lord Jesus and the people that he gathers to himself. And so to help us to see that, turn with me to the book of 1 Peter and chapter 2 of 1 Peter, right towards the end of the New Testament. One Peter chapter two, and and have a listen to how Peter speaks firstly about Jesus, and then also about Jesus's people, about Christians. One Peter chapter two from verse four. Peter writes, "As you come to Him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to Him." You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, 
and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It's stunning, isn't it? (laughs) Peter lifts the language of Exodus 19 and God's promises there to Israel and he says to his readers, most probably a mixture of Jewish and Gentile background Christian believers, and he says to them, because of Jesus, that's you. (laughs) This is your identity. This is who you are. This chosen and precious capstone, this living stone, the Lord Jesus has rescued you and made you his people, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So Israel may have failed, but in Christ and his people, you and I, God's plans and purposes for his saved, his rescued people, they live on. Isn't that just breathtaking? We have a rescuing God and we are his rescued people. As we move now into the rest of chapter 19 and chapter 20, we see that this rescuing God is also a holy God. And his rescued people are also to be a holy people. Holy God, holy people. As Israel encounters and meets their God at Mount Sinai, God's holiness, it gets impressed upon us in a, in a number of different ways. Firstly, strict regulations are set down for the people. Chapter 19, verse 10. And the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready for by the third day because on that day the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So that's what Israel do. They make preparations for this encounter with God. They've got to ready themselves with clean clothes. Secondly, when the third day does arrive, there are various what we might call natural elements that communicate that God is holy. And this might feel a little bit weird for you, but I want you just to close your eyes for a moment and and imagine the scene. Imagine this scene. There are repeated claps of thunder and lightning strikes all around you. A dense, thick, cloud surrounds you. Smoke is billowing up from the mountain like smoke from a furnace. There's the sound of a trumpet that's getting louder and louder and louder. The mountain itself is trembling violently and you and everyone else around you is trembling as well. Okay, if you've closed them, you can open your eyes now. (laughs) It is an awesome, fearsome, multi-layered experience that can be seen and heard and felt. Clearly, you don't mess with this God. Thirdly, there are repeated warnings right throughout the passage. So have a look, for instance, at chapter 19, verse 21. I'll read from the end of verse 20, chapter 19. So Moses went up and the Lord said to him, go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord and many of them perish. Even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out against them. 
Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up Mount Sinai because you, your, you yourself warned us, put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. The Lord replied, go down and bring Aaron up with you. But the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord or he will break out against them. He is a holy God. You can't just rock on up to him. You come to him on his terms and no other. Fourthly, the role that Moses plays here indicates something of God's holiness as well. The people, they stay at a distance, chapter 20, end of verse 18, and they say to the Moses, verse 19, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. The people, they stay at a distance as Moses approaches God and goes up and down the mountain on their behalf. He intercedes for them. He acts as a mediator between them and God, this holy God. And finally, of course, the Ten Commandments themselves communicate to us that this is a holy God and that as such, Israel are to be his holy people Israel don't dictate to God how this relationship will work, how to do things, far from it. God is the one giving the commandments. We're not going to go into them in any detail now. As Matt said, we've set aside next term to look at them one by one, but both in terms of how Israel are to revere and worship God, commandments one to four, and how Israel are to treat others, commandments five to ten, we see God's holiness. And we see Israel's holiness, what their God is like, they're to be like. Holy God, holy people. So in all these different ways, we see in these chapters that the rescuing God is also a holy God. I love the moment in C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, where the children are talking to the beavers about Aslan. Is, uh, is he a man? asked Lucy. Aslan a man, said Mr Beaver sternly. Certainly not. I tell you, he is the king of the wood and the son of the great emperor beyond the sea. Don't you know who is the king of the beasts? Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Ooh, said Susan. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather, feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. I think that gets the sense of what we see in this encounter, this meeting with God in Exodus, the strict regulations, the, the natural elements, so to speak, the repeated warnings, the fact that Moses has to act as a mediator, the Ten Commandments themselves, they all communicate that this is a holy God that Israel is dealing with. He certainly isn't safe. And in response, Israel are to be his holy people. Now, as Christians, it's important for us to realise that we're not in the same position as Israel. We stand and we live and we relate to God on this side of Jesus and his death and resurrection, Jesus makes it possible for us to come boldly and confidently and with assurance before God. But as we do that, we also need to remember that God hasn't changed. He's still the same. And so our confidence should not descend into casualness. Our boldness should not descend and slide into flippancy. The book of Hebrews is really helpful for us here because it relates this episode in Exodus 
to believers like us. So turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Again, right towards the end of the Bible, just before 1 Peter that we looked at before. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, I'm going to read from verse 18. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. Exodus 19 and 20. But, verse 22, But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You see, as Christians, we haven't come to that mountain that we've just been reading about in Exodus. We've come to a different mountain. We've been brought to heaven itself by Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. We are recipients of a sprinkled blood that speaks a better word. How then are we to respond? Well, have a look from verse 25 of Hebrews 12. Verse 25, how are we to respond? See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. I find this absolutely fascinating that at the end of a book that is so rich and detailed in its teaching about the person and work of Christ that he is our great high priest, our mediator, that he is our once-for-all sacrifice, his sprinkled blood which opens up to us such confidence and closeness and boldness and intimacy with God so that we are to be thankful, of course, oh so thankful, but we are also to have reverence and awe because of who God is. He is no doting grandfather figure. He is holy. That will impact how we pray. That will affect our views on issues. That will speak into the way that we live, our obedience, our holiness. He is a rescuing God. We are his rescued people through the Lord Jesus and his death and resurrection. He is also a holy God. And as his rescued people, we are to be his holy people. May God help us to be the people he has made us to be. Let's pray.
our rescuing God, we praise and thank you that you are the one who has first acted on our behalf. That in your grace and mercy you have rescued us through the Lord Jesus, established a relationship with us, carried us on eagle's wings out of danger and into a place of safety and refuge, bringing us to yourself. We are your rescued people, and we are so thankful. Our holy God, in our thankfulness, protect us from a casualness and a flippancy that denies your holiness. Help us to recognise that we are to be your holy people, working us by your Holy Spirit, so that we might be people who relate to you, who worship you with thankfulness, and with reverence and awe. Amen.